All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda Bender, the founder and CEO of Kilo. At Kilo, we want to help men be better every day in order to live their best lives. And what we do is we help men track qualitative data. So things like your sleep, your mood, your libido, and your energy in order to give you personalized insights to help you with your mental health. And what we're doing is hosting events like this one with men, as you can see here, talking about feelings, talking about mental health, their tips and tools that they use in order to strengthen their emotional fitness. This is our second event. On the first one, we talked to four different men about their feelings. So today we're going to speak with Eric Wu. Hi, Eric. Hi, Amanda. <laughs> We're going to speak with John Roach. Hi, John. Good to see you again, as well as Tommy Nearman. Thanks, Tommy, for joining. It's good to see you. So let's kick it off with you, Eric. Um, you and I spoke a little bit in the past about you taking this eight-month uh, journey and learning so much about yourself and doing self-discovery. So can you tell us a little bit more about that, what you learned and what tips and tools you've come away with now in the present moment for your mental health? Yeah, well, uh, I'm also a, a founder and uh, founded my company in 2010. And uh, we bootstrapped it. I had two other founders and through the years, uh, almost we're kind of had this moment, maybe eight years in, uh, where my wheels came off and came off really noticeably to me, of course, noticeably to my co-founders and my employees. Uh, and I was stuck. I was stuck mm -hmm. emotionally. I was stuck uh, physically, started manifesting all sorts of funny health problems, you know, the kind of things where you go to see a doctor and they say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to do for this particular, you know, digestive issue, for instance. Mm -hmm. And um, it got bad enough that uh, in late 2018, my co-founders fired me. And it was a really hard thing for them, right? Like they am asking me to leave. And of course, uh, eight years in, uh, they couldn't actually purely fire me. It was more of a, hey, we really think you need to leave. We don't want you here anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was devastated and uh and stuck right but mm -hmm. it it was ultimately the push i needed to really focus on hey what's going wrong here for me and uh and i could say with confidence now looking backwards you know two years later there was a lot going wrong for me uh i was trained as an engineer definitely had an affinity as an engineer and for those of you in the mm -hmm. audience who know engineers uh, we're all about solving problems, right? And <laughs> ultimately, this was a problem I had no idea how to address. Uh, I was stuck. And, you know, when I look back and I say, well, that was the push I needed, that was the gift I needed from my co-founders to go figure out how to put my wheels back on and kind of rebuild myself. What I didn't understand at the time was I was really depressed and i was really anxious mm -hmm. and you know the emotional pieces for me were so bottled up you know that my experience of depression was very much like eating cold mashed potatoes for every meal right it was, yeah what was that like was it showing up for you physically too you mentioned that earlier yeah i couldn't digest my food very well i had uh mm -hmm. i had a freak hiatal hernia uh that nobody could explain why my stomach was squeezing up into my chest Right. There were a lot of like funny things happening physiologically, mm -hmm. but probably the harder part was I couldn't feel anything. You know, even the anger and the shame and the, uh, the devastation to be fired by your co-founders from something you'd spent eight years building was muted in many ways. Yeah. Right. Like, so again, I think about like depression for me wasn't being so sad it was being so gray and not mm. having a lot of emotional anything other than this like tedious cold gray bland experience of life 
And that push for that from them led me to then spend a lot of time understanding my own depression and uh, learning a lot about trauma and and the idea that uh, you know so many of the patterns that we generate as little kids uh, to deal with whatever traumatic things we're experiencing oftentimes work really well until <laughs> they stop working. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was really where I had ended up was my maladaptive stuff had worked great. I'd been successful and I'd been achieving until it stopped. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and being able to get to that point of going, well, I guess I got to relearn and in some ways take apart some of the stuff that I've been doing so that I could get to uh, feeling things again, ultimately, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, that idea for me of like, well, depression ended up as a nutritional barrier, almost a, an emotional barrier, right? All I could feel at some level was some anger about things other people had done to me, and mm -hmm. I couldn't feel joy, and I couldn't feel curiosity, and I couldn't feel all these other pieces, in part because I'd been blocking pain and not letting myself feel pain. Right. And so like the, the journey to put it back together ultimately was really painful. Ultimately it was really harsh. Right. Mm -hmm. That was 18 months of me wondering if I was ever going to be suitable to work again, wondering if I was, uh, anybody that anybody, you know, somebody that anybody else could be around. The guy felt so toxic mm -hmm. and letting myself feel that pain and accepting the fact that, yeah, life's going to be filled with pain. And getting to that understanding of like, once you accept that pain is part of life, maybe you mm -hmm. find out that pain has some stuff for you, yeah. some gifts. And for me, part of that was uh, reconnecting with the joy in the world, reconnecting mm -hmm. with the very simple, you know, the way the sun hit the flowers, the way the yeah. bees jumped from flower to flower, like standing outside in my backyard and just looking around and appreciating all the good stuff in the world. That's kind of how I knew I was on the right track with letting myself feel all the pain too, mm -hmm. because ultimately I got both, right? I got appreciation. I got tapped into the great stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and along with that, got to really feel a lot of the pain and the frustration that I had been walled off from, from maybe my entire life. Mm -hmm. uh, so that 18 month journey all culminated in me reconciling with my co-founders uh, with at the beginning of the pandemic, me returning as the CEO of the company, right? And mm -hmm. and coming, uh, ultimately returning and saying, I'm gonna do it different. Mm -hmm. uh, leadership took on a whole new color, a whole new perspective, right? Leadership more than anything ended up being about how do I love my team? How do I love the people around me? How do I bring that love in a way that's constructive and uh, helpful and supportive, right? And mm -hmm. ultimately arming me to do some of the hard, scary things that I'd always been uh, scared of, conflict, right? Giving, giving critical feedback. Uh, mm -hmm. Once I knew I had unconditional love in my heart, I was able to become a much more effective leader. Mm -hmm. And it was funny on my way back in, uh, half the company had been hired at that point while I was out and introducing myself as somebody who knew a lot about mental health now, right? My own experience of it and had a new appreciation for what it was going to mean for all of us working in 100% remote, completely uncertain conditions as the pandemic really took off last year. Mm -hmm. I got a little bit of a surprise gift from my team as individually one-on-one -on -one, people started showing up to chat and say, I want to share my journey with you, or I want to talk about my own mental health struggles with you, right? Mm -hmm. and we became a company and a team that had a lot more patience for each other mm -hmm. and a lot more grace mm -hmm. for each other and a lot more uh, understanding, right? That we are quite messy, us humans, that we're quite complex, right? And at any given moment, whatever's going on, we only know a very small piece of it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and being open to the fact that I don't know anybody else's story, right? I can't know anybody else's story, but what I can do is love, right? What I can do is appreciate. And what I can do is be curio curi curious and own my contribution to it, yeah. right? So really an 18 month journey here that uh, for me culminated in very much a profoundly different way of being.
right? A profoundly different way of leading, a profoundly way of, different way of showing up in my relationships. Uh, well, so pretty, pretty, pretty big deal, right? And I'll, I'll share one last anecdote to close here. Uh, one of my, one of my execs on my leadership team who was hired while I was out said to me, Hey, I've heard the stories of what Eric used to be like. And it's really, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know how to think about those stories given what I know of you now, right? Mm -hmm. Are you just a completely hundred percent different person? And that's not quite accurate either, right? So I can talk about this profound change for me and the profound uh, difference that I find, but I'm still, you know, that guy that was a jerk. I'm still that guy that couldn't quite access anything <laughs> except anger. Um, right. And so that, that, you know, what it leads me to conclude for myself is, well, this is the rest of my life kind of walking this path, right? This is an 18 month journey that was profound for me. And it kind of sets up what the rest of my life is in terms of continuing to seek that growth, continuing to find new places uh, where there's an invitation to be different, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, you know, I'm a profoundly different person and I'm still the same person, right? Uh, yeah, that duality that we find often when we talk about mental health, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think a few things that you said that really Matt Help, who was on the first part of Men Talking Feelings, spoke about after he shared his story more publicly that more and more people came up to him and said, like, "Wow, it can happen to you too." I didn't even realize that someone like you could struggle with mental health or you know present with depression and it really um, opened the door to a lot of great conversations between him and other men about mental health and i remember you telling me that and sharing it here today like do you still have conversations with people has that died down what does it look like now for you Oh, very much. Yeah. I, uh, not only are people feeling a lot more comfortable bringing, you know, their struggles to me. Uh, what I'm finding more and more is like, that's some of the richest, most energizing conversations I get to have in mm -hmm. my week. Right. And so mm -hmm. me showing up and say, Hey, I'm open. Right. I'm curious. Uh, in many ways signaling like i don't have a lot of judgment here and so whatever that struggle might look like right it's going to be an okay place to come and chat with me about it mm -hmm. uh and inevitably it weaves its way into the professional world of course mm -hmm. but um but so much of it is it, it's a different paradigm to come into work and know that your ceo knows about it right? Know mm -hmm. that your CEO has an appreciation for, you may not be at your best right now. It doesn't mean you don't want to be at your best, right? And there may be some things that need to mm -hmm. change or some, some things you're blind to, right? That we could help you see, but it may be that you just need a little bit of time and space mm -hmm. and finding that balance between, you know, ultimately helping a, a team achieve its goals and an organization achieve its goals while also caring for the individuals and kind of wrapping you know, our metaphorical arms around each other and, and, mm -hmm. and understanding that the collective good ultimately serves, you know, our larger goals, uh, and taking care of those individuals who might have a struggle that's happening. Uh, for me, that's a very different way than I was kind of raised in the professional world. And I think mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, both, you know, it, it's, it's not just men, but across my entire team, the fact that I'm open to these ideas or open to this conversation uh, has really marked it, an evolution in our culture for the team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you always have to balance, you know, you're running a business at the end of the day, you got to balance uh, the business's uh, goals and, and progress and survival. Mm -hmm. uh, but gosh, it is a totally different set of meaning when you yeah. understand that this organization achieving its goals is ultimately about serving the individuals who make up you know the whole yeah. uh and it is a like i said it's i'm able to terminate employees i'm able to have hard conversations with employees i'm able to give very direct feedback now because mm -hmm. i ultimately know 
this is coming from a place of love, like unconditional mm -hmm. love. And if this is not the right place for you anymore, right? That is not, mm -hmm. we're, not we're not echoing the things from our childhood of being rejected from our family unit or whatever mm -hmm. it might be that makes it so scary to look around and realize something's changed here and I'm no longer a fit or this organization mm -hmm. no longer a fit for me, right? And those are okay things in a way that probably scared the shit out of me, you know, mm -hmm. five years ago. Uh, and and being able to model that for other people as a leader, being exactly. able to, to to fill those shoes and not even have to preach it, but simply to live mm -hmm. it. And it gives people, you know, the space to be a little bit different. Yeah, there's two things I wanna highlight. First is piggyback on what you just said, Eric, is that as more leaders are becoming as transparent as they can be about their own mental health or supporting their employees and their teams within their organization, I really do think it's opening up um, just more conversations around taking mental health days, you know, maybe taking a morning off to re-energize or refocus on something and that not everyone works a nine to five Monday through Friday, that there's changes and it ebbs and it flows. And when it comes from leadership supporting this idea that your mental health is so valuable because without good mental health, how can one perform at a job and feel good about the work and the projects that they're doing, I think is really important. And society is definitely waking up to that. Larger tech companies are doing it. Smaller, you know, business owners are doing it as well. So I'm happy you mentioned, mentioned that, excuse me. The other thing is that I think you highlighted, which is really important for men, I've heard this many conversations I've had is, a lot of times depression and anxiety shows up first as physical symptoms mm. um, because a lot of the men I'm talking to aren't as attuned with what it feels like in their body aside from maybe intestinal pain or headaches or back aches. And I thought the way that you described it as saying like you felt gray is such a great um it sounds weird to say great thing, but like an indicator for you that there's this color wash, I'll call it, on the world. And there's something that I'm not seeing. There's this this grayness there and, oh, maybe I ought to pay attention to that. So, you know, for for men listening, if, if that starts to come in, you know, things aren't as bright anymore, you know, you start feeling these physical symptoms to really tune into the body because I often say this, at Kilo is like we are feeling beings that think. So first and foremost, we're feeling these different things and tuning into them can help us make adjustments, hopefully sooner rather than later before we can't consume our food or are unable to take in the nutrients our bodies need. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that work I did over those 18 months was so focused on the body, mm -hmm. was so focused, you know, like the theoretical underpinning that Peter Levine right, introduced with, uh, you know, the idea that traumatic stress gets stored in your nervous system, right, and continues to echo mm -hmm. in your nervous system. And even though you may not know what the story of that traumatic stress, it may have been happened before you were conscious, pre-verbal, yeah. ancestral even, you inherited it, right? Whatever that is that's resonating inside your nervous system is ultimately causing like problems for your mental health, challenges for your mental health, right? But also your physical health. And so that idea of like, you know, the tips and tricks that I might offer uh, the audience, right? Ultimately, like building a yoga practice for me mm -hmm. and appreciating yoga as something pretty far beyond simple fitness, that there is something beyond stretching and breathing that's happening on that mat uh, and accepting that. And again, as an engineer, as somebody who, uh, grounds themselves mm -hmm. in science, like that was a pretty mm -hmm. big jump for me to get mm -hmm. to this idea that uh, there's something almost magic, right? And magic in the sense of like, it's unexplainable. You can feel it. You don't necessarily have to have the story of it, right? But you can mm -hmm. feel the benefit uh, to a yoga practice. At least I can, mm -hmm. right? I think a lot of people get there in other ways. Dancing. Uh, I'm convinced anybody who does extreme endurance sports is probably mm -hmm. getting yeah. there. Right. Ultra yeah. marathoners are probably finding it without even knowing that they're finding it. But it is body centered mm -hmm. for me, for sure. Right. And so to your point, time and space to get into your body, time and space to like pay attention to how you're feeling inside your body uh, is critical.
right? We send so much of our modern working lives in our brain, like the, the top front part of our brain, right? And that's it. Uh, yeah. And, and there's so much more happening. So Eric, if, if audience members or people that watch this later want to get in touch with you, how can they if you're open to that? Uh, gosh, uh, LinkedIn is probably the, okay. yeah, the best way. The best way. Yeah. So Eric Wu on LinkedIn, if you want to yep. connect with him, I'm going to bring everyone back on screen now. Our panel. Um, and I was just going to share how I met Eric. So actually I had posted men uh, talking about feelings part one and someone commented on the post and said like, oh, Eric, you might be interested in checking this out. And then I was like, who is this Eric person? And I just reached out to Eric and he was super open to talk to me. Um, and these are the types of conversations that Kilo loves to have is men being willing to tell their stories. You know, I'm not looking for experts to speak um, at these events, but um, someone like yourself, Eric, and the other guys that we'll talk today. So thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. All right, Tommy, how are you? I know you've been waiting patiently here. <laughs> no, I'm good. I blocked out the hour. Awesome. So actually, Tommy and I met um, through a friend. So Terrence Davey was one of the speakers at part one of Men Talking Feelings. And Tommy heard about the event from Terrence's fiance, Olivia. And then he and I got connected and just had a cool conversation about where he's at in life and his emotional fitness journey. Um, so Tommy, share with us what's been happening in the last year and a half. Yeah, yeah. I'll try the best of my ability. It's not really something I talk about too much, but yeah. 2019 for me, work-wise, just, I was kind of at a burnout. So for me growing up and most of my adult life, emotions, feeling emotions, talking about emotions was really not something I did, not something I grew up di doing, not something I learned about, not something I even really acknowledged. It was always more just kind of push through things, keep going, do the job, move forward. And by 2019, I was just in this state of horrible, horrible depression while still working crazy hours and constantly on call. So I deal with filming and special events, which are very on-demand type industry. So I would get constantly a lot of call. And I almost think of it like my abusive relationship a little bit because I was working for this I was working this way for so long that I thought I deserved to be in this position. This is what I deserve to feel, and this is only natural for people. So really, December 2019, I was just dead inside and burning out and not knowing where to go and started making little changes in February. And then the pandemic hit, which really, at that point, besides making it easier to grow my hair out, which I decided to do already, kind of left me with no events, no filming and no job. It was just me left alone after feeling so horrible about my work and myself and left mm -hmm. alone to feel my own feelings, which was foreign to me. I had no idea where to begin or how to deal with this or what to do. I had coping mechanisms mm -hmm. that would keep me numb and get me through the day, but that's all I was doing. So for a while, at least in the beginning of the pandemic, I was really trying hard just on my own to be better. Whatever better was, I just thought I can be a little bit better. I'll get through this. And I was getting nowhere. It was, I'm trying to think of a good comparison. I was trying to keep myself afloat yeah. without knowing how to swim. And I was just drowning on my own. I knew I didn't need to be under the water. I knew that's the wrong way to go about this, but I just couldn't keep myself afloat anymore. And mm -hmm. it was just me at home with my fiance who had work, but just me alone with my feelings in my head. So mm -hmm. a big thing for me, besides finally finding a therapist who really worked for me, but opening up and talking about how I viewed myself, how I viewed these emotions, which really I did not view myself in any way. If like if somebody hated me to the level that I was hating myself and just beating mm -hmm. myself up, I would think I like stole their money, ran over their dog. Like I was just horrible to myself. 
And while I'm trying to get better and do these steps with the therapist, it was kind of this slow climb up to be okay with where I'm at and okay with feeling my emotions, feeling okay with who I am and really giving myself more tools to deal with different scenarios, not just be numb and push through everything, but check in with myself, how I'm feeling, doing things that would work a little bit more with me, like getting kind of that mm -hmm. fitness routine. But even as I came back to work, really making sure I always call it five minutes for me in the morning, where after I work out, I just take mm -hmm. five minutes, no matter if I'm running late, no matter what's going on, to meditate. It's not a lot, but just that level of sitting still and checking in with myself, honestly, might be better than the workouts. Because even now, did, I'm, oh yes. Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, how did you, how did you come up with that five minutes for me? I like that a lot. No, oh, it sounded catchy. That's it. Yeah. I just needed to give myself, like I had to sell it to myself. Yeah, like, totally. To That's myself. so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have to get my own self on board with it in a way where it's like, oh, okay, five minutes for me. That sounds catchy. And it's a little easier to process than I'm going to sit there without moving for five minutes, which if you know me, I'm not, I don't sit still. My work's constant calls, constant changing, switching lanes a lot. And then just for myself personally, I don't sit still. I can't focus on things if they're one topic too much. It's really difficult. And even then it was going, as I went to work, I didn't, I kind of had this ease in moment of new me coming back, lost weight, hair long and everything. But then I dived right back into, we had the Oscars at Union Station. So I went from not working for almost a year to kind of easing back in to just nonstop. I think the last week I worked 86 hours on my time card and then had a car accident the next day, which again threw everything else out of whack. And it's all these things that I don't think I would have been comfortable dealing with or learning how to check in with myself instead of just going to work. And even now it's this new process of as I go through the day, making sure I'm okay, seeing what I feel, and being more aware of it instead of just come in, push through, and move on. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, Tommy, that in the past you had some unsuccessful coping techniques before you started, you know, five minutes for me and added some other tools to your toolbox. So can you just take us back for a minute? Like, what were those, why were those things not working? And how did you wake up to the fact that they weren't working and that you needed new tools? Yeah, I think some of it was just being younger and professional, which, okay, you work a lot, so you want to go have fun then. And the problem was fun for me started not being fun anymore. It was just a nonstop journey of work, social life, drinking was a big one for me, go home, have some drinks to just kind of check out, tune out, which... Sometimes it's nice to check out when you're home, but not as a constant way to deal with your day and your constant pressures and phone calls, which always be the thing I'd get called like weekends, 5 a.m. And it'd always be something that had need to be solved and just be all these unhealthy habits, all patterns of eating and stress and just no time. So really like for me too, when the pandemic hit, I quit drinking was a big one. Just cause, I mean, you're home anyway, so it's really, if you're drinking by yourself at home during a pandemic while you're not working, this might surprise you, but it's not very fun. It's kind of sad. Mm -hmm. You feel very sad mm -hmm. with it. But that was a big one for me to really take away a coping method that I had and force and me to then, do other things. Yeah, exactly. You recognize like this is not a healthy coping technique during this time. I need to change some shit up. <laughs> yeah, and there's also the point too, though. It's not like I ever was doing it and thought to myself, oh, I'm being very healthy right now. It was just, this was the solution and the way I could make things work. Be numb for work, go through it all, deal with everything, deal with what felt like an abusive relationship with my job, and then go home, not think about it, just relax and rinse and repeat. Sundays would just mentally be so tiring for me because I'd know everything coming up for that week and I'd feel exhausted before I started. Mm -hmm. And I'd have things like I do distance running or things to like 
work out the stress, work out the anxiety, but it wasn't really solving the problem or solving how I felt about it. It was just physically working it out. And now, because you and I have talked about new t like new tools that you have in your toolkit um, to help you currently, what are those things and how did you learn how to do them? Yeah, so I mean, big one, again, that five minute meditation. Mm -hmm. I think I can't undersell it over workouts, over everything else, just really, it's almost giving yourself permission to have five minutes to you which for anyone who gets really busy or feels like their schedule is so demanding taking that time can be a lot or feel like a lot or feel like you're not doing what's best instead of doing what's best for you and i think that's really helped me immensely but also just documenting keeping track of how i feel and why so like if i work an overnight shift because one of my guys can't make it and the next day i'm tired I'm still documenting it. I'm still keeping track of how I feel and why with it because I think it's important to acknowledge it because it's so easy to just go about your day and not check in with yourself. So both writing it down, that's what I've been using a Kilo app for. They're not paying me to say this. I am using the Kilo <laughs> app, but it helps me check in each day with different – and you guys have seen it, but it helps me check in where am I sleep, where am I with tired, and just overall feelings. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you for saying that. We're not paying Tommy or anyone else here to, to use the Kilo app. I mean, if um, you need to start paying people, I'm open to it, but. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, I think, I think what I'm hearing from a lot of men that I talk to and interview who are using the app is that there comes this moment, and I think Eric was also speaking to this, where you check in with yourself one day and you're like, holy shit, I'm not where I wanna be, something has to change. And in that moment, where do you go? Like, if you have a supportive community, that's great. If you have a connection to a therapist, that's great. But I think for some men that don't have that, where do you start? Do you have, um, I'm asking you, Tom, like, do you have a recommendation for where someone could start looking or what they could do to start to gather like information or to put tools in their toolbox? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. If, if I was to look back or see me, if I could look in the future from December 2019 or January and look at me now, besides the hair being longer, I don't think I'd recognize who I am. Because I think sometimes you get, you have these expectations of what you should be doing and where you should be and how you should handle things. And when you're not there and when you're in a down moment or when you feel like you're drowning, it seems really hard to raise up. And it seems it's a slow process. It's not like you have a, I think transformational moments happen, but I think long-term it's just little baby steps to help you get better just those little moments to kind of crawl out or just swim to the top. Cause it seems easy to look at people who are like, oh, they have this down, why can't I be that good? And you need to just focus on what you can do for yourself. So like, I think a big one is just, if you don't exercise, adding that to your roster, even a little bit and keeping track of it. So like me and my fiance, we have a calendar where we mark our workouts every day and we don't do it every day, but it feels really good at the end of the month to see, oh, we did a full week. We did this many days and it started a lot slower with meditating, just doing it to begin with and reaching that level. I think it's really, I think there's this thing where it's like, I'm going to be better and you just expect it to happen and it doesn't happen that quickly. And especially with a therapist, you don't know what's going to come out or what you're going to talk about or where these issues will come from. So I think really forgiving and giving yourself, don't, at least for me, don't be so hard on yourself with it and realize this will take time. But one year from now, one month from now, if you can look back and just say, going to the therapist, meditating, all these little steps helped move you higher to where you want to be, that's a win. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So Eric's talking about having transparent conversations about mental health, 
you're sharing, like take time for yourself, five minute meditation, add exercise in. Um, I'm a huge proponent of just taking walks. Sometimes people say, oh, I don't want to go to a gym or I don't want to run, et cetera. I'm like, just walk for five minutes, you know, walk. Be mindful of your feet touching the ground. Um, and even that five minutes for yourself can really help with a check-in. So, Yeah, so many good. people ask so much of us, I feel like, and only now more than ever with our phones, with our jobs, with always being connected, that it's hard for us to take that time. And yeah. I think that helps immensely. Yeah. Tell me if anyone in the audience or anyone watching this wants to get in touch with you, how can they? Um, that's a good question. I guess email, okay. LinkedIn. Yeah, I think LinkedIn's super easy, right? So if anyone yeah, wants go, to connect with Tom, being like, oh, go to my LinkedIn, look at my mm -hmm. like credentials and that, but it feels very <laughs> self promoting But yeah, LinkedIn, if it works, my email's on there. <laughs> You can always leave me a voicemail. I probably won't pick up the phone because I think phone calls these days are almost all spam if you don't know who it is. But I'll listen to the voicemail. Cool. Cool. Thanks, Tommy. Um, all right, John, let's have you come up on stage. I feel like it's like this is what we have now. We no longer have stages for live events. We have the virtual room. Yeah. And. John and I met actually, so you heard about Kilo from Adam Hoffman, who was working with me on the last event, I believe, right? No, I actually I actually met you in the authentic Slack channel. Ah, yes. Sorry. Yes, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, can you tell people what the authentic uh, community is? Sure. It's a, um, it's a phrase that was coined by Rebecca Bastain, who's the founder of Own Trail. And um, she coined that phrase to describe companies who are um, community focused, who are focused on, on outcomes, who are focused on um, technology that improves and enhances, uh, you know, human experience rather than subjugating it socially or solely for the sake of profit. So I probably didn't state the manifesto quite as precisely as she would have, but um, she's written a lot about it. She's she writes for Forbes as well. So if you Google the term authentic, a u t h e n t e c h, you'll you'll come up with her her uh, article kind of promoting the idea, and it's it's really cool. There's I don't know. There's like a hundred plus founders in that um, in that Slack now that are all kind of running and trying to build companies based on those values. Thank you. And we didn't talk about you sharing about authentic, uh, authentic community. So <laughs> thanks for letting me sh throw that curveball to yeah, you. If you're, if you're listening, Rebecca, I hope I did you proud. <laughs> yes. Yes. So we got connected there. And then John and I had a conversation about his um, feelings and story. So John, I just want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about your mental health journey and then why you started uh, Whole Story. Sure. Which is so exciting because both Tommy and Eric's journeys are so consistent with what we're trying to do with Whole Story. So I'll uh, hopefully bring it back around to that at the end. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was so great to hear Eric and Tommy share and, and, um, I saw so many parallels and connection points with, with things that I've um, experienced, but my, you know, my journey from a mental health perspective started a little differently. I was, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a alcoholic and an addict and I have a type one bipolar diagnosis and um, you know, all of those things uh, meant that going back all the way to high school, I was hearing from parents, professionals, um, peers that I had things wrong with me, you know, that I needed to take care of, that I needed to address. And I didn't want to believe it. You know, I, I was um, in my first outpatient drug rehab group when I was 17 years old, uh, I started going kind of because I was forced to to AA meetings, to 12-step meetings when I was um, 17 years old. And 
you know, I was really high functioning um, in, in all of my bad habits and, and early addictions. So, you know, I still got great grades. And at least in my early career, you know, I, I did well enough to be able to keep people off my back. But it, it sort of created this early resistance and, and this, um, this path of discovery for me where I was looking for all of these alternative explanations for what was going on with me, other than, you know, you have some actually kind of foundational like substance abuse and, and mental health uh, issues that, that you need to take seriously and address. And so I, you know, I was um, always open to and searching out any other explanation than the one that people were trying to, to give me to help me explain my behavior and my feelings. And so, you know, it, I mean, I've, I've followed the path that's very similar to, to many others with substance abuse disorder um, who are also comorbid, who have a, a legitimate, for me, um, you know, mood disorder diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So in my denial for all of those years, I just continued to progress in both of those areas until um, in, in 1999, I ended up hospitalized for the first time and then rapidly again uh, the second time for my bipolar disorder after a manic episode. And then I spent six years wrestling with the medication question. You know, at that point, I had kind of accepted that this thing is real and if I don't do something it's going to mean that I don't get to have all the things that I want to have. I really didn't have a lot of self-awareness at that point, but at a practical level, I was willing at least to finally listen because the pain of, of, uh, and the, the, the destruction that had been caused in my life at that point was enough to make me pay attention, but I didn't want to take drugs and the drugs that they were giving me, you know, blunted my cognition. I, I was still working, um, you know, in, in IT roles and tech roles at a pretty high level. And those, those drugs, if you've, if you've been on the manic end of things by default, they sort of, you know, start you off at a level that, that almost always rounds off the edges of your cognition. And if you're someone who has a sense of pride, whether false pride or otherwise in the way that your brain works, um, then, you know, that's reason enough for you to go off your meds, which I did a bunch of times in that six years. I went through a number of different cycles with different psychiatrists um, until ultimately in 2005, I found a doctor who I could really work with and who listened to me and understood me. Um, and we found the right medication for me. And two years after that, I quit alcohol and drugs completely. That was in 2007. And so for, for 13 years, I've been, you know, clean and sober and on the same stabilizing medication regimen. Um, and it's been incredible because, you know, all the things that I was afraid of about, you know, medication turning me into a, a blunted version of myself or, you know, not using alcohol and recreational drugs anymore is going to, you know, turn me into a social pariah or take away the, the thing that up till that point I kind of defined myself as. I sort of saw myself as this professional partier, you know, and so there were all these kind of in retrospect juvenile identity aspects of that part of my journey, the fears that I was really holding on to. Um, you know, that, that were, but, but in, in the moment, they were super important for me to be able to reckon with and talk honestly about. And, and so I, I do just want to say that in terms of the theme of the event and men talking about feelings, you know, through that journey of mine, I've, you know, I've been to therapists and counselors and psychologists and 12 step meetings, many, many, many 12 step meetings. Um, and, you know, and I've, now I'm, I'm married with children and I have these incredible relationships. And, and the reason I'm able to have these incredible relationships is because I learned how to talk about my feelings. And at all of those places, all of those, you know, stops within the mental health and sobriety industrial complex along the way, a foundational principle 
especially for men, was that you got to learn how to talk about your feelings because it's the beginning of self-awareness. And, you know, in, in our Western culture and, and one of the byproducts of patriarchy is that we as men are not taught how to, that, that it's even important to acknowledge the whole swath of the spectrum of feelings that we encounter. And in so doing, we end up repressing things and not even being aware of it. And so as a foundational step, you know, learning how to talk about my feelings and, and have a little bit of trust and to let go of the fear that comes along with taking that first step towards authenticity in communication, um, you know, first with a therapist or first in a group setting, but then later, you know, with people in your life, in my life, enabling the, you know, a new depth to the type of relationships that we're able to have. And I heard Eric talk about it so beautifully in his, in his, uh, you know, sharing about the way his story and his transparency with this story has changed the culture in that organization. That is the effect that this can have, you know, the courage to, to share your feelings and to talk about your feelings is contagious. And, you know, it's part of what excites me about the, the prospect of apps like Kilo, you know, that, that if we can, if we can sort of destigmatize this idea that men aren't supposed to talk about their feelings, it can actually be um, really profound, kind of at a grassroots and, and spreading level, you know? Mm -hmm. So with Whole Story, I mean, Whole Story, you know, we're, we're a, a company that provides insights into diverse life experiences to power better hiring. And it, it was founded based on my own journey and my own recognition that, you know, as a, as a CIO and a CTO, you know, for small and large companies, I, I came to realize that and we're hiring all these people and we're not hiring them in a way that gives us any insight into who they are as people. And that what we call soft skills in the business world you know, is actually about people's character. Who are they? All those things that Eric was talking about, you know, that mm -hmm. leadership journey. And if we don't understand that journey in someone, how can we understand who they really are going to show up as a professional as in our workplace? So whole story is about adding a little bit of that vulnerability um, into the interview conversation and making it really easy for, for job candidates to be able to share authentically about their life experiences in terms of how they shaped who they are as a professional. And then we also give companies the ability and the tools to understand and interpret that information and then integrate it into their hiring process. So ultimately, you know, my view is that the most important of those qualities are self-awareness and humility. That Those are the foundations of authentic leadership. And I think that you know, your, your emotional health and your ability to talk about your feelings and your own journey in that way are indicative of that self-awareness and humility. So it's really exciting to be talking with uh, a bunch of folks who, who get it and who are really um, being so open and honest about those journeys that they've been on. Because I think, like I said, it is contagious and there's so much more that I could say. I wish this was a two hour conversation. But I, know. I know George still, uh, we want to give him some time, so I'm going to shut up for now. No, no need to shut up. No need to say that. I think what's so helpful about what you're sharing is that you've gone through many different journeys. You've gone through addiction. You've gone through diagnosis. And now you've started a company where you want people to be more authentic about their stories. And thank you for just talking so specifically about feelings in particular and really wanting to remove that stigma because I think as we have one conversation at a time, you know, once this event is over, Kila will have had eight conversations in this event series and wants to do more. But I really think the more conversations we have, just the larger the voice gets and hopefully the stigma gets smaller and smaller. So thank you for highlighting that, John. Yeah. Um, I think you might say LinkedIn too, but how would you like people to get uh, in contact with you if they want to? <laughs> yeah, LinkedIn's great. And I've already sent LinkedIn uh, requests to Tommy and Eric both. So uh, great. I'll, I'll report back whether, they're, whether they work or not. 
<laughs> Wonderful. Just going to bring everyone on. Um, all right. Last but not least, we have my friend George Lee. Uh, so George and I actually met a year ago. I think we were talking about it today, about a year ago in a networking happy hour group. And what I appreciated about George is he was really interested in my entrepreneurial journey. And um, we actually talk weekly now about the projects he's working on, about Kilo and how that's moving along. And we've created this, we call each other accountability buddies. Um, and we really have a good time and sometimes have great hard chats about what we're working on and what's the ethos of the mission of our companies. And George recently shared something with me that he has been taking mental health days. And I asked him to come on to share a bit more about that. So George, tell me how you came to this idea and what you've been doing with your mental health days. Yeah, Bender. Um, yeah, well, this is probably like a little bit of a lightning round. So, you know, yeah. I'm one to talk fast. So, you know, <laughs> thankfully that, that kind of works out. Um, I think that like in, you know, and speaking from like an entrepreneur's perspective and, you know, uh, trying to bring tremendous value to hopefully any entrepreneurs in there in the audience, you know, like we always talk about how like the journey of a startup is the roller coaster, right? It's always ups and downs and ups and downs. And I think that something that kind of people forget about with roller coasters, as many times as you take the ride, there's kind of that slow chug, 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 chug to get to the top before you start, you know, going through your ups and downs. And even, you know, in some sophisticated roller coasters, you'll have like those moments where they kind of slow you around a bend and then they'll drop you and all that type of stuff. And that's kind of how I see like mental health days. It's, it's um, you know, you just kind of taking a step back, taking a moment of your time to refresh, to, you know, get ready for the next round, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty big analogy guy, right? And, um, you know, it's, it's like boxers in a ring, right? Once you, you know, you fight your bout, you know, you fight your round, uh, and then once the round's over, you know, you go back to your corner, you got to reset, get ready for the next one. And for a startup, it, you know, it's relentless, right? And, you know, you just got many rounds to fight and uh, many different things. And um, I think that the, the notion of mental health days, it might not be an actual day for me, you know, in some cases, uh, it might just be like, you know, uh, a few hours that are just recreational time. In some cases, I may consider uh, a mental health day being, you know what, I may not get anything done today. I'm just going to work at whatever pace I feel comfortable with. I'm just not feeling it today. And I'm not going to be hard on myself for, you know, me not finishing work or me losing focus or whatever, right? As long as I'm, you know, in the game, I'm good. And I think that that's a incredibly important thing. And how do you decide that, George? It's a really good point. How do you decide whether you're going to take a whole day or if you're going to take a few hours? How do you check in with yourself to make that decision? Well, you know, using my Kilo app, if I'm ever recording a bunch of really low scores, <laughs> you know, that's, that's probably a pretty good indication. Um, you know, I think that there's a natural indication, right? I think that like Kilo is like a formalization of like maybe some internal motions, right? And it maybe it helps like, you know, that you're not lying to yourself when you really like put it to paper that you're not feeling where you're at, right? For me, you know, it's it's big milestones, right? Like, hey, we just hit like a big milestone. We did something awesome, secured an awesome contract. You know, in like a corporate world, you might just say, hey, take the next day off, right? Or whatever. I like to think that, you know, we just hit a giant milestone, our KPIs are met, then, you know, we're not, you know, in impending doom, then, okay, let's slow down the tempo, let everyone, you know, reload, get ready for the next fight, right? And I think that that's such an important point of view for a lot of entrepreneurs to avoid burnout and, you know, um, you know, keep their mind in the game, because I know that there's so many distractions, so many different things, and, you know, sometimes you just let the distractions wash over you right? Let it, let it out of your system and get ready so that the next time you're in the fight, you're dead focused on what you're doing. So hopefully uh, yeah. that was a, a good sharing and, uh, you know, brought, brought the audience and everyone value. Yeah, I know we're at a lightning round at the end here, but what I think is really valuable about what you're sharing is that 
we don't have to let other people give us permission to take mental health days. We have to give ourselves permission. We have to check in with ourselves to say, you know what, today, Wednesday, June 9th, I need to take a few hours in the morning to do yoga. Eric talked about yoga or do a five minute meditation for yourself like Eric spoke about or Tom, um, John talked about like just connecting with others and sharing your feelings and talking about what's going on with you. Like, Giving yourself permission to take time to take care of your mental health is really, really important. And we can't wait around for other people to say, are you burned out? Like, what's happening with you? I think you need to take a day off. So, so yeah, unfortunately, I have to drop right now. Um, I know so, it's going to bring everybody um, back on to say know, bye. Thank you so much for having me, Bender. I have to drop into a, another yeah. urgent call. So great Thanks, to meet George. everyone. Thank you everyone for coming on. Thank you for talking about Kilo Unsolicited. Um, and I hope anyone listening, if you're re-watching this, that these tips and tools can help you strengthen your emotional fitness. If you wanna reach out to me, I'm on LinkedIn as well, Amanda Bender. Um, and I look forward to having many more conversations like this. So thank you, John. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Eric. Have a wonderful rest of your day and be sure to take care of your mental health. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye.